Well, jokes on all chat. I don't actually don't know my mom's email address because she's not in my life because she's dead. So it's a prank, bro. Actually, it's not a prank. She really died. So it's cool. <laughs> and on that note, do you guys want to talk about dead parents in space? Because we can. Are y'all ready? I don't have any music because I'll get a DMCA. Guess what? I'm not reading chat for this. <laughs> I could read chat just a smidge, but I have a feeling it's gonna be like hella bad if I do that because I'm gonna get really distracted. Do we get a PowerPoint as well? What do you mean? What did you think I was gonna do? Wait, you thought, I, how did you think I was gonna present this to you? Do you think I was just gonna, how do I talk about this without a PowerPoint? You didn't think I'd do that. Like, how did you think I would present it? With a piece of paper that I'd be reading off of? No! <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine if I just anyway about my paper I wrote about the last Jedi being the best movie of all time Like do you think I was just gonna like fucking just present this shit like that boy? Nah, I hate a presentation. You thought this was off the dome? Bitch! Y'all gonna be off the dome. Your girl had two months of work here. You are off the dome. I'm not. That's the deal. We're in defense of Last Jedi here. I am the Star Wars lawyer today, okay? Nah, y'all better fucking work today. If you're new here, you probably have not seen me on Twitch talking about The Last Jedi. We've had several streams where we just, you know, go about it and chat just derails me and I end up feeding into them about how I think that The Last Jedi does not deserve the toxic heaps of trash <laughs> thrown at its face. And I'm talking like we've sat here for full five hour streams in heated discussions. So I'm here to finally put all of my thoughts into words out loud for you to try to showcase why I think this movie doesn't deserve these toxic fans that seem to just to write it off without actually listening to what Ryan Johnson was putting down. Yes, the film does have its flaws, but the proportions that viewers have made it out to be is not only silly, but petty. And if you digest it without your rule book, there, can you turn those off actually, Dragon? Because they're really loud in my ear. If you digest it without your rule book, there's a lot of rich storytelling in this movie, far more than ever before in the history of Star Wars. And if you hate The Last Jedi or love The Last Jedi or even didn't even care and just enjoyed every single one of the films, this is the presentation for you. So we have to lay out some ground rules and it's important because this is gonna be the problem problem here. And it's, it's gonna drive me fucking nuts. All right, so regardless of the hot takes and memes, we have to make sure to reference the source material barely. And that means that we need to regard the prequels, even if we hate them, every single one of them, okay? We have to. And second, since this is the second film in the trilogy, we have to disregard Rise of Skywalker being out. So let's approach this film without the third in mind at all. And for this reason, I wanted to emphasize how much the toxic fandom screamed so hard, had no imagination that as a result, result the third movie that came out was worse than we could have ever imagined. And mind you, I had fun watching all three, but I'm saddened that the story had potential to get stronger and it was run over by fanboys. So that's the, se that's the second rule. And third, we are only, and we will only be discussing the fucking movies, nothing more or less and we're going to be talking about only the films that had cinematic releases specifically for casual fans who don't watch The Clone Wars or intake any other form of media that is deemed as extracurricular. You want to know why? Because George Lucas doesn't even give a fuck about any of the extended universes as rules set by the fandoms, and he's the creator of the entire world. So we will, for the sake of approaching this presentation without trailing off in a million directions, honor that. Oh, and like obviously spoilers, so yeah. My goal here is to take an analytical slash entertaining review of how The Last Jedi is most certainly not the film that deserves the flack it constantly gets. You're free to be incorrect and disagree with me, and I am no authority by any means, but when it comes to tackling this topic, I have to have this conversation with people without having something previously written down, simply because... I have so many ideas funneling and trying to get them out of my mouth is really difficult for me. Hence why I'm going to be loosely reading off something that I've typed out. All discussions on what I talk about are probably not anymore because I'm fucking sick and tired of talking about it. Saved for after the PowerPoint. But I think we're just going to like boot up Resident Evil 7 and I'm not going to regard you guys at all. Just keep it on YouTube when I upload it there. I'm not going to have it. I don't want to. I promise you. Yeah. So alerts are also turned off now to like lower distractions. I love it when people come into chat right now and they just wrote, Ryan 
Johnson ruined Star Wars! Wow, damn. The toxic fandom did ruin Star Wars. Johnson grew up watching Star Wars and Indiana Jones much like the rest of us, and in addition to his fascination with cinema, Johnson frequently borrowed his parents' camcorders when he was little, and he used to make his own home movies, which he would play on his family's VCR, and they were like, damn, son, you fucking talented as hell. And... When he grew up, Johnson ended up directing several of these films. Knives Out, Looper, The Brothers Bloom, which I actually haven't seen, but it's got really, really good reviews. And also three episodes of Breaking Bad, which I don't know if y'all fucking knew. So anyway, my presentation went black. Sorry, wrong. Wait, now I got to do my thing over. Okay, so this one, this one, and this one. Three episodes of Breaking Bad as well. You've seen these. These are great movies. These are great things. One episode of Breaking Bad, however, was very divisive and still many critics perceived it as one of the best. The episode titled Fly, packed with symbolism and deep dialogue, was a bottle episode featuring just Walter White and Jesse Pinkman, who were afraid that a fly had contaminated their meth production. And uh, it, the reception didn't form a clear consensus. And this is the only episode of Breaking Bad ever to sip a lower rating of 8.0 out of 10. So, Osmandius, which is the other episode, holds a perfect score directed by, you know, you know, Brian Johnson, uh, has a perfect score of 10 out of 10 rating on IMDb. This episode carries a notable connection to the famous Percy Bleichy Shelley poem of the same name, but it features the death of a principal character and the end of Walter White's drug empire. And not only is it viewed as Breaking Bad's best episode, but it is also regarded as one of the greatest episodes in TV history. So clearly this isn't the first time that Ryan Johnson is going to make a heavily divisive film, and it certainly wouldn't be his last. Irregardless, John Johnson went on to receive many awards for his work and spoilers, he did get some for his, you know, work in The Last Jedi. And he received a lot of high regards. And also, look at him, he cute as hell! Oh my god! Also, Ryan Johnson demonstrated through directing, character relatability, moral compass, and keeping things less drab with a kiss of comedy. And as a result, Lucasfilms was super intrigued and wanted to work with him. Also, he directed the 2020 Pokemon Go trailer. So that's like fucking cool. Having worked on this for a while, but I said I started to put some like little tiny inside jokes in here and they need to like kind of flow. But um, I'm just going to have to throw you guys in the deep end for the sake of cluing you in on this like weird one joke I'm going to have throughout the whole fucking thing. I found myself really overwhelmed as to where exactly to begin and turns out there's like no seamless way to address any of my points. So we're just going to have to jump right off. I believe that too much detail can kill a story. My mystery is just so powerful. In A New Hope, which is the first installment of the Star Wars films, we see Vader for the very first time. We're not sure if he's even human at this rate, and we soon find out that he used to be a Jedi. So that and Obi also had a some sort of kind of connection, but we're not entirely enveloped with Vader's story, though most of us are more curious about Luke and we're more enveloped into his saga. However, most viewers were to the point where they found themselves curious for more context about Vader, but we didn't demand with tantrums and we didn't get all our questions answered. So instead we just waited for the other films to just carry out the other story. But also I do want to preface the fact that a majority of us have seen Star Wars when we were like younger and our parents mainly saw him come out in theatrical release. So if we could just binge, but like, you know, hey. In Empire, which is the second of the films, we discover that Vader is actually Luke's father, which actually tells us more about Luke than it does about Vader. <laughs> so we already knew that Vader was a good Jedi at one point, but something switched in him to turn him over to the dark side, which ends up leaving us knowing that there could potentially be some mysterious turmoil in Luke for his future as well. So, you know, let's continue. In the absolute last of the original trilogy, we still have a third reveal of Vader. And since the films maintain its mystery, once we get a face reveal, another mystery just ends up coming back up, which leads us with even more questions. This is still a giant revelation in and of itself. And each movie that passes, we learn one more key element to Vader as each episode progresses. So this begs the question for the audience of how did this happen to him and how did he end up in his suit? So we didn't need details on Vader, for the story that was being told, and the mystery inspired people to continue wondering what happened to him long after these films were over. So, 
This is what happens when things get over-explained. So when the prequels explicitly show how Vader turned over, a whole bunch of fucking fans were disappointed that it didn't live up to their imagination, and many Star Wars fans cannot seem to learn that after decades of books, comics, and video games nailed into their brains, that it is taken for granted that people want to know every last detail of every inch of every character. And I want to just say, I do think that can be a good thing, but... At the same time, I find that this fixation on the little details can result in suffocating the large mythology that Star Wars has always been a vehicle for. So we're going to come back to this point, but I just want you to keep this in mind. Oh, I need to drink water. I'm talking. Oh, my God. I hit the rock. So anyway, I want to bring your attention to this. Snoke. Y'all going to be so fucking mad at me. <laughs> You're going to be so fucking mad at me. When Snoke appeared on screen, fans rioted due to the fact that he had little to no backstory, and I mean, they fucking rioted. Like, okay, uh, I'm gonna just sidebar this for a second. Um, when I was doing my research, I found many people on YouTube and other different sites alluding to the fact that people actually made $15 million in damages over rioting about Snoke. However, when I looked to find footage of this, I can't, like, type that in and find out that that's the general purpose of their rioting, but I do want to let that be known that that's some of the reports of what they were rioting over. However, I did find a lot of uh, <clears throat> theaters that their projectors broke during the first hour of the debuts of The Force Awakens and uh, The Last Jedi. And so that's still fucked up. <laughs> I just want to say black and black. We're not you can't even have critiques yet You're not allowed to have critiques about what I'm talking about. I'm not even done. We just we just fucking we're not even started yet I'd like to bring your attention to exhibit B <laughs> Palpatine He looks to be thousands of years old and remember the rule. We're not regarding extracurricular content Okay. He's more powerful than Vader. In fact, he wiped out the Jedi and he actually turned democracy into a fascist empire. And there's so much of a story there, yet we learn fucking nothing about him or where he came from. And I have to remind you again, no comic books, no other films, nothing else. You have to fucking deal with it. In addition to this, his whole explanation of his rise to power was really lackluster in the prequels. Palpatine is important to the Star Wars universe, but he is literally just a wedge between Luke and Vader. I'm going to elaborate on it. So essentially, Luke is an angel figure and Palpatine is a devil figure. The triangle between these two characters uh, is, is a plot device to realize the tug and pull of the desire and place where they fit in with the Force. So... I'd actually like to call these characters princess companions because Star Wars is actually owned by Disney now, so that's funny. But I think that if you guys notice, nearly every single Disney princess movie that has ever come out has an animal companion, right? And some of them can talk and some of them can't. Lately, they've been making ones where they don't talk. But if they do, that's okay. It's just these characters' purposes are to take the temperature of the main character to allow them to monologue their internal thoughts. And through this, we're able to learn about where our hero and villain lies on changing their mind throughout the entire story. That being said, Snoke is literally an offshoot of Palpatine. Snoke is only an extension of Kylo Ren. Kylo needs to kill Snoke to make his character move forwards and needs Rey to help him do it. But due to the lack of backstory of Snoke, which you have to ignore Rise of Skywalker, I promise you just have to. This is how it's so this is how Rise of Skywalker is just so fucking trash. Fans seemed upset over this until Rise of Skywalker's film, which we're not acknowledging that fans were mad that they did not get their fully installed Wikipedia page filled out before he was killed off. So if you're the kind of fan that is upset that Snoke wasn't flushed out before he was killed, let me show you this. This is probably what you would have wanted. Kill me with the crudest stroke. But first, let me tell you about the summers I spent on Nylar 7. Growing up, I always had a fascination with antique clocks. The ticking, oh. The talking. Cynthia was the first to break my... <laughs> I tore hers out of her body! Never had Boba Pie kill Dabe Boba Pie. Oh. 
Not yet, child. We haven't even gotten to my quinceanera yet. If you can't hear it, then I don't feel bad for you. Anyway, I get commonly asked, Danica, did you enjoy watching Snoke die unceremoniously? And my answer is always going to be yes. Uh, so another example of this is Broom Boy, which goes by the name of Tamiri Blag, apparently. Did you know that? Broom Boy has a fucking name. But that doesn't matter because he's just a storytelling device and he is never introduced by name ever at all. Like many fans like really fucking blew this out of proportion. Why the fuck? Anyway, so we're going to come back to Broom Boy, but I just want to let it be known that there are zero moments in Last Jedi where his name was like ever mentioned. And I really need to emphasize that. So one of the common counter arguments about Broom Boy from Star Wars fans I've heard is an implication of his own standalone film. And I'd like to say that this is some sort of reflex reaction from Lucasfilms and Disney cramming merch into our brains. And some of the viewers flinched at the storytelling device that they or they just craved more to the point where it inhibited their ability to enjoy a story being told before their eyes. So not to trail off in a million directions, we're going to come back to Broom Boy. But now that I have informed you of how much detail can ruin the enjoyment of a Star Wars film, keep this in mind as we continue throughout. All right. So unlike any of the Star Wars films, theme, uh, uh, the Star Wars films, themes are actually not really that heavily known and made very aware. So most of the themes are pretty much just general. So when George Lucas went on to a CBS News interview with Charlie Rose for a one-on-one -on -one interview, which spanned for 55 minutes long, he said, quote, it's all about generations and all about fathers, sons, and grandfathers, unquote, which is kind of wild, actually. The main themes for Star Wars were actually more just family drama, which is why I personally started to call these films, there's just something about the Skywalkers. The first one obvious is destruction versus preservation. Old ideas cannot work forever. They have to be abandoned after a while. However, burning and destroying the past isn't a good idea. If you burn everything, even good history and even bad history, everything will be lost, which is why Kylo Ren literally states one of the main theses of the movie entirely. There has to be balance between old and new and finding a balance is where the conflict lies in this film. So even though Kylo presents himself as uncaring, he has still killed his past, which is an embodiment of him actually just killing his father. Spoiler. And you can see the emotional turmoil this action has caused him throughout this whole film. Kylo is trying to forget that he killed his literal past to prove that he can be the next Darth Vader. This is a constant wrestling inside of him and it's lost between light and dark ever since the whole death scene, which I know this is a photo from Rise of Skywalker, but it just, it gets my fucking point across, okay? So after prolonged abuse from Snoke, Kylo gets the feeling that he is being used and his suspicions leave him to when given the chance to kill Leia, his mother, he can't bring him to do so. So this scene also elaborates that he's having changes in his heart as well. So we're also gonna discuss more on how letting his past die affected him on Crate, but more on that in a second. Uh, time after time, Kylo is unable to surrender to the light or come towards the dark. All that turns out is him just being a hot complimented mess of emotions. Why? Because he's destroying his past constantly and not even regarding it at all which is why you see constant tantrums on his end. And then you see Kylo confronting his emotional struggle when it finally shows more complicated turmoil in him still, once again, hesitates to choose a side. As opposed to Rey. In comparison to Kylo, Rey never destroyed her past. She kept all of her lessons in her back pocket and played her cards close to the chest. Rey spends the previous films searching for her past and what her parents were. Then she doesn't find any answers when she arrives to Luke's island. Rey ended up going straight to the dark side to get information on her past with zero hesitation when it offered her something that she had needed without even trying to stop herself. She didn't give a fuck. And then she's forced to come to terms with the fact that there's no easy way to answer or solve this. She has to determine who she is herself. Ray did not let the past die, actually. She instead broke her dependency on the specific question that was being begged to answer but more on ray in a second it's important th this is where this gets so complicated here's an easier one the decision to preserve or destroy is really hardcore spelled out for viewers in the very opening scene of the last jedi Leia's choice to preserve her fleet versus Poe trying to destroy a dreadnought shows on a very on-the-nose scene. They couldn't have spelled it more out for you guys where Leia wants Poe to come back and ignore the giant big ol' fuck-off ship. 
that is that, that Poe wants to just destroy. It's causing a massive amount of death to the Resistance crew, and as a result, we see Rose's sister's death. And oh my God, a side note, if you want to get a book on the sister who passes away in this scene, you can. You can have elaboration on a character that's used as a plot device to move the story forward, just in case you can't have your character fleshed out before they get killed on screen. Don't worry. They can do that for you. Don't have a panic attack. It can be all fleshed out. Don't worry. Don't freak out. It's okay, Star Wars fans. It's okay hey, this person has a purpose. But anyway, Poe thinks it's a victory because they destroyed the big old fuck-off ship, and Leia thinks otherwise, showing that the Resistance barely even had a fleet, nor proper amounts of resources used up by trying to destroy the ship in the first place. Therefore, this is an empty victory. In the end, due to Poe's bullshit, there's no fleet for the crew, and resources were more valuable than heroics in this moment. But just like Luke with the Jedi... Poe is actually filled with giant mis misconceptions about the role that he's growing into. She has no discipline like the other Jedi. Oh my God, the way doesn't even have to get shut up. Shut up. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> but the way she don't even train yet. Anyway, sorry. I had to give in once. What I loved about Ryan Johnson made Poe learn the hard way about leadership all without an X-Wing, since this is what he's only ever known for. So Poe's understanding is that leadership is all about heroics and bravery. However, it is also a leader's job to prevent as many deaths as well. So since Poe had zero concept of that and wanted a hero badge for killing off a large ship, which resulted in a lot of death, he's fucking demoted, okay? That's what happens. Forcing a traditionally heroic character and making him have to deal with his responsibilities slash realities of leadership is fucking cool. And Star Wars does have way, way too many shoot first and ask questions later characters. In fact, I would think that they're like the capital of that. For the first time, we're seeing one of those characters that Star Wars has traditionally formed and they're being told, how about you just fucking think for a second? And this arc in Poe's character is showcased that he could once become the leader of the Resistance in the new future, the near future. So Poe also fucks up again by going to Canto Bight just to do more when he was already told to sit because he's still caught up in chasing heroics. And also a side note, Poe did deserve to be executed for damaging resources as badly as he did. Leia certainly was biased towards Poe. I mean, like, I'd have his fucking head. Like, I would just kill him. Like, I would just, I would fucking kill him. This takes us to our next theme. Failure and learning from it. So, failure is inevitable, and not one person can go through life without experiencing some sort of failure. And nothing but 100% success every time. So, all throughout history in Star Wars, there's been so many times where they have just said the quotes of... Oh, wow. The odds are just really stacked against us, but this just might just be crazy enough to just fucking work. And guess what? In this movie? No. <laughs> I love it! Which is awesome! This movie told you, nah, it's not gonna work. Stop repeating old history. So Star Wars makes fun of its own classic trope that they have done time and time again, which is among many of the reasons why this film is highly fascinating to me. The act of showing characters hit failure develop resilience from unsuccessful attempts, make their own story more fulfilling, relatable, and well-rounded, shows a struggle, an overcoming of a said struggle, and then growth. So showing the good guys trying to help and only making it worse. In this film, we're shown that failure isn't a reason to give up and stop trying, though, but these actions might seem like a zero-sum gain, but from a tactical standpoint, the characters wind up in situations similar to or like worse than the ones that they were in before. And yet all of these failures have a deliberate purpose to help the characters grow. And to reiterate, this is best explained via character. So we're gonna start with the biggest one of all, Luke. <laughs> Man, this is gonna be like a fucking Luke presentation, I swear to God, I am so. Luke insisted that the Jedi lose their history, which did align him with the bad guys in this regard by burning the sacred text. However, he hesitated his thoughts, and Yoda is the one who burnt the sacred text by just going like this, and then the whole like fucking lightning and shit. Oh my god. Books. So he hesitated. Yoda's the one who burnt the books, and this both falls under destruction versus preservation, and at the same time falls under learning from failure. So this is where I talk about how like 
it's really hard to figure out where to put this piece because it because Luke actually ties in all three of all like two or three of the themes together. It's just really hard to 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 rank what he's doing in all one realm theme wise. So Yoda tells Luke, "We are what they grow beyond," which means our failure and successes teach the future. Just as Rey learns and grows beyond what Luke and his failures can teach her. Just as she steals away those ancient Jedi texts before they can be destroyed forever. Not all of them, just some of them. To potentially build on these ideas herself. So must Star Wars as a franchise. If this keeps going, it has to change. Respect its past and learn from it. Let it go and move on. So there's a quote in Force Awakens where Solo said to Leia that there's too much Vader in that boy. And Leia replies with, that's why I wanted him to train with Luke. Luke could see the danger from the beginning and more than likely tried everything in his power up to a very specific point, which we're about to discuss. And this is where people started to fucking hate the films. It is heavily implied in The Last Jedi that Luke failed to restart the Jedi Order and in addition failed to prevent his nephew from going to the dark side. Luke encouraged it by not killing Ben. Luke could have saved all of the Jedi he was training and all of the destruction Ben would bring to everything Luke had loved. However, Luke couldn't go through with it because it is not in his character. Ben is also someone Luke loves. It is his nephew. How the fuck do you think Leia would feel if he killed her, her, her fucking son? Like, come on. Once again, Luke falters before doing the right thing. Many say that this isn't like Luke because Luke's always trying to save his loved ones and friends and this is what this moment is absolutely about. Murdering his nephew is certainly not the Jedi way and once again, Luke falters before doing the other right thing. You remember the other one? You remember the one he didn't do? The one he, no, that one with his dad? What, yeah, you remember he was gonna kill him? Oh, no, he didn't do that either. Luke decided to not intervene in order to break the Jedi pattern that has been laid out for thousands of years. And what is this pattern I'm talking about? ...of light users which allowed a super powerful Sith to pull Anakin to the dark side and destroy them. As the last Jedi died out, the force began to flow through Luke and he pulled Anakin back to the light, leading to the Sith being destroyed. Or not. I'm leaving Palpatine out of this until we know what the fuck is going on. Luke began training a new generation of Jedi, and with Snoke apparently being the only counterbalance, Ben was pulled to the dark side to even things out. He destroyed the Jedi, which led to Luke abandoning the Force, leaving no active Jedi on the light side. This led to Kylo being pulled back to the light. I feel it again. The pull to, to the light, finding an outlet through Rey. I warned my young apprentice that as he grew stronger, his equal in the light would rise. That constant back and forth has defined Kylo Ren's character. I'm being torn apart. He's like a desperate cultist looking for an escape, and Snoke has convinced him that the answer is going fully to the dark side and becoming the next Darth Vader. You guys get what I'm talking about now with this whole cycle of the, the Jedi repeating the history and all that shit. Because some people don't know. Uh, <laughs> and they don't remember any of this information. Luke also believed in a completely idealized version of the Jedi based off of a few brief sentences given by Yoda and Obi-Wan, and Luke assumed it would work, and then Luke and Leia tried to restore the old versions and it went badly right away this time. Granted, this moment right here is a conversation about Anakin during the prequels, but the scene showcases what the Jedi have always assumed was the right way of bringing balance to the Force. A glimpse into Yoda was that the prophecy could have been potentially misread and this also could allude to the fact that maybe the jedi are not always in the right but this is also just a little chip in the foreshadowing in addition to this it's not a huge wrench to throw in the storyline that maybe the jedi are also realizing they're flawed i mean like this could be conceived as a bit of a stretch however i don't think so because right after this scene a lot of things ended up coming bad for the jedi is he not to destroy the sith and bring balance to the force so the prophecy says. A prophecy that Miss Reg could have been. So then you could be like, well, Danica, they're talking about Anakin specifically. I'm like, well, well then, well, well, then. Well, then that happened right after. So that went well for them, right? 
Like, I think they kind of misread that po- prof- blah, 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 the prophecy. I bet they misread that shit. Side note, <laughs> Ewan McGregor couldn't stop laughing when he had to deliver the lines killing younglings, so he had to cover his face in that scene, which I think is hilarious. Also, I want to bring your attention to one of my favorite memes. He's killing younglings, and he's just like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> To quote Luke in The Last Jedi, the legacy of the Jedi is failure, and at the height of their power, they allow Darth Sidious to rise and create the Empire and wipe them out. Uh, So Kylo fully awakens him to the truth that the Jedi are actually failures. So Luke's hesitation to train Rey doesn't see not to seem hard, crass, or just difficult. Luke knew that if he tried to teach her, this cycle is just going to fucking continue again. Uh, another side note, when seeing this film, I don't know if you guys caught on to the recollective story that Kylo Ren was saying was just, just inaccurate enough to raise doubt about what really happened. But if you didn't catch on, I'm going to show you. Luke actually looked really wide-eyed and crazy and completely not like him, according to Kylo Ren's telling to Rey. But when Luke retold his account of the whole ordeal, he looked at his saber with tears in his eyes full of regret, weight in his decision, to the point where he's completely disgusted with his intrusive thoughts, and Skywalker instinctively ignited his saber before quickly realizing his error, and it was just absolutely too late. So then the truth was told, and I really enjoyed the sequence of how in reality, stories can actually be misinterpreted with half context. But I bet Luke looked that way to Kylo, And I'd probably feel the same way about Luke if I was in Kylo's shoes. So this film really showcased misunderstandings and how that kind of happens. Anyways, back to what I was saying. So all the failure Rey endures helps aid her further in the story and shows her strength as a character. Rey tries to get Luke to train her. Then he never does. Then she tries to get him to join the resistance. He doesn't. Then she goes into a cave looking for answers about her family and finds nothing. And Kylo and Rey both confide into one another that they both have been uh, failed by the light and the dark side of the force, which as a result, they have to find a new path forward. And in this way, they have an unexpected bond. And if they can actually solve their differences, they can bring true balance to the force. But again, Kylo keeps burning his fucking past and he's not paying attention. When Rey produces Luke's Excalibur, Luke yeets it off a cliff, which Luke would like never do that. That's totally out of his character. He would never throw a lightsaber ever. That's not him. He he would absolutely never do that. Not once. This saber represents all the wrong in his life. He resents it and the myth attached to it. However, this puts Luke in the direct line of knowing that he's everybody's last hope and he can't do anything for them. So once Luke is worn down and gives in to Rey's demands for training, history starts to show a glimpse of beginning to repeating itself, where Luke finally sees Kylo reaching out to Rey, which is the same token as Kylo getting sought out, well, Ben Solo being sought out by Snoke, It looks the same to Luke. Luke again fights back with preservation versus destruction. Luke didn't forget the past even if he had a moment of weakness as we commonly see that he does and Rey leaves to go to Kylo. The result is exactly what takes Luke into the scene. Rey decides to burn the texts. A flash of repeating the past and learning from it. A huge theme in this film and we're seeing Luke attempt to burn the past No, Yoda fucking does. But it's okay, because Rey took some of those books, so it's not completely forgotten, which is another example of what we've been talking about. But I don't know how on the nose this had to have been, but I feel that fans just dismiss the complexity of something not being so heavily spelled out for them. And Luke knew that being on on one side of the spectrum wasn't going to work, and Rey was under the assumption that history had to repeat itself. So Luke took himself out of the equation the best way he knew how. And in order for the greater good, nothing would change if he had touched that lightsaber and went in to go kill all the bad guys like all these motherfucking people did. Okay? So Luke showcases that he is not working off immaturity like he had an empire where he worked freshly off of impulse. And then the new trilogy, he shows there's a desperate need for a permanent solution to this conflict, which some people argued ruins this happy ending of Return of the Jedi, which... 
is just like think about it if the jedi are flawed from the beginning and then luke's like yo i'm a fucking jedi happy ending that just signifies that nothing has been fixed at all He's realized that if he brings the Jedi back into this, then the Sith are going to rise up again, and the whole thing is going to start again, and it's just going to be more, more misery. Here's the here's Finn. The fact that Finn and Poe's plans fail is connected to another major theme of the Last Jedi: failing and overcoming failure. So Finn was actually never a hero. He's simply a regular guy being there at the right moment at the right time, and everyone else. Uh, is telling him otherwise. So Finn's arc shows the importance of heroes and legends. A man who's doing the right thing at the right time. In The Force Awakens, all Finn was ever doing was being selfish and wanting to leave at any way possible and disappear. Finn was not joining the Resistance and only stuck around to rescue Rey. And regardless, he's a hero overnight. Fails to escape and lead Rey away from conflict in The Force Awakens, yet his only mission was just to help Right, only. So to quote Ryan Johnson's thoughts via The Last Jedi audio commentary on Finn's character, he said, quote, I really love the notion that he, is, that he has left the First Order, but he actually really hasn't joined the Resistance either. Everything Finn does is in The Force Awakens, has only ever, including taking him to the Starkiller base, it's not to help the Resistance, it's just to help Rey. He always acts out of personal and not ideological motivations. So Finn's importance is reflected in the recollection that Rose recaps about with Finn before he boards an escape pod and then feels guilt seeing her reality ruined by him attempting to desert. However, throughout the story, Finn is feeling pressure to live up to this falsified myth that Rose had perceived of him. So Rose and Finn actually fail to find the code breaker they were sent for. This code breaker showcases Finn's point of view of right or wrong, as well as his desire to flee, something that he has always felt deserting, felt for deserting back in The Force Awakens. But this code breaker is like the princess companion for Finn. This is how he can confirm in these scenes that he's going to state his certainty on where he aligns. So... Their mission to deactivate the First Order tracker ends in failure with their ally betraying them and revealing the Resistance escape plan. So Finn also tries to make a suicide run to take out a battering gun, but fails at that too. But we're still going to have a whole crate category, so put that put a pin in that one. But by the end of Finn's arc, he truly becomes the hero that Rose thought he was. And then Rose is inspired to become a hero within of herself instead of just a person working under the ship of the maintenance department. However, more on that topic later. So... Let's talk about the biggest elephant in the room here, Luke. He tended to be the biggest challenge of all the characters in the story for every single viewer. So before getting into Luke's character, Ryan Johnson didn't actually decide to make uh, Luke a broken hermit, and neither did J.J. Abrams. George Lucas did, actually, so that's kind of fun. Love that for him. A lot of fans were wondering what George Lucas's vision of Star Wars 7, 8, and 9 would have been. Well, thanks to this book that I saw called Art of Star Wars The Last Jedi, we have our first and only look at some of the designs that were created for him and his vision of the films. Now, I did say that books are out and extracurricular activity is as well, but these are blueprints for what created these films. And this is different. This isn't lore. This is a behind the scenes look. This is essentially storyboarding. So according to the book, one of the first meetings in the development of Seven took place at Skywalker Ranch in 2013 with George Lucas in attendance. And this is where this concept was presented. So the concept art you're seeing here features the design of a Jedi temple, which was approved by Lucas along with art that shows an older Luke Skywalker with his disciple that he named Kira and who is later named Rey. And we also see a piece of Skywalker where he's standing next to some ruins on a planet uh, known uh, where the Jedi Temple is located, which is later known as Ak-2, which I think I'm saying that right, wrong, but I don't fucking care. And then there's a piece that shows Skywalker meditating in the same format that we've seen in The Last Jedi. The idea was that after the fall of the Empire, Luke had gone to a dark place and secluded himself inside of a Jedi temple on a new planet. Apparently, the initial plan for Star Wars Episode Seven was that Luke, over the course of the movie, would rediscover his 
Vitality and train a new Jedi. So basically what we got from Rey and Luke's storyline in The Last Jedi was initially supposed to be the bones for George Lucas's Episode 7. So imagine an alternate universe where uh, Episode 7, Luke reluctantly trained a new Jedi. It would have been completely different. The reason that they didn't take the new trilogy in this direction was because the creative team felt like Luke Skywalker would better serve the needs of the story as the person that everyone seeks out but doesn't find until the final scene of The Force Awakens. Personally, I like that decision better. I I think the other way is really cliche and stupid. So Lucas approved all of these visions and these choices, and the directors followed through. So it wasn't their choice. But... There's a lot of discussion that Luke didn't deserve to have a secluded lifestyle because he was charismatic, upbeat, and that's just one side of his character. In addition to this, Luke has never been what you've wanted him to be. There's many times where he whines, complains, and gets impatient, and then Luke tries to become a badass, ends up getting annoyed, nearly kills his fucking dad after he says so many times there's still good in him. Like, what? Oh, fix this ride. I'm never gonna get out of here. If there's a bright center to the universe, you're on the planet that it's farthest from. Where are you going? Looks like I'm going nowhere. Can't believe he's gone. Oh, two, what are we doing here? No, I don't even know what I'm doing here. We're wasting our time. The boy has no patience. We'll never get it out now. Always with you, it cannot be done. I can't. You want the impossible. I can't do it, Ardu. You can't go on alone. I'm endangering the mission. I shouldn't have come. I have no memory of my I never knew her. Then my father is truly dead. Soon I'll be dead. And you with me. He was certain that Vader was still a good guy. There is still good in him. There is good in him. I felt it. And nearly killed him in a fit of hateful rage. To say that The Last Jedi ruined Luke based off the common complaints from fans is as if they didn't pay close enough attention to the original series. Luke's never been the character who you wanted him to be. And that's why he works well as a protagonist. Once he wanted to see Luke's challenges be over, simply just wanted fan service. And to see the characters doing exactly what they were doing before. Exactly as they were before. Just, uh, older. And gray. In addition to this, I have never seen a reunion film that was actually, like, really well done. Like, the story used Han, Leia, and Luke to highlight how this journey isn't about them, but it's about the new characters. Also, it's not disrespectful to deny a character a happy ending. It's disrespectful to parade them around for nostalgia's sake. God damn it. To nostalgia's sake without moving them forward. So, there's actually an interview with Mark Hamill uh, at South by Southwest in 2018, where Hamill says that reunions are inherently disappointing. And for context... Star Wars is actually heavily based off of King Arthur and several other things that you guys are probably going to name because it's in a collection of different types of stories to the point where it's actually a parody, but then it like does a full circle on itself and becomes original content somewhere. So anyway, another quote from Ryan Johnson exactly across from Mark Hamill at the same interview says, if you look at it, if you look at the beginning of the hero's journey, He's pulled out the sword, uh, the sword out of the stone, and he has descended. Then if the story goes past that and life, as they get into middle age and beyond, it gets into darker places. And there's a reason for that. It's because myths are not made to sell action figures. Myths are made to reflect the most difficult transitions in life. And so once again, myths are not there to sell products and action figures They're made to reflect difficult transitions we face in life. So the biggest strength in this story and series is showing how history evolves and seeing characters fit in different roles over time, which breaks the chain of the merch push that we've commonly seen throughout Star Wars, and I mean the prequels for damn sure. A sidebar, there is a lot less Porg in this movie, and I I love that. Thank God. I'm sick of the Porgs. I fucking don't like them. And also, they have these cute little fox dudes called Texes, and they're like crystal foxes, and I wanted merch from that so bad, and I can't find any damn thing at all. I have one stuffed animal that I got, uh, and it was really hard to find. That's it. So I'm just saying. (laughs) This brings up a whole other topic 
that's fascinating. And I think a lot of people need to discuss this. If myth stories are not designed to sell merch, I think it's just a horrible fit for Disney to own the properties to Star Wars. Their desire is for merch sales. It's just a bad, it's just bad to profit off of it, which is why they totally just made Rogue One to profit off of Rogue One so that they could get so many sales because they didn't have to tell a myth story. Anyway, um, I'm not gonna read all of this clearly. Look at that, look at the sheer girth of this. This is too much, this is a lot, okay? Throughout all of my research and everything, Ryan Johnson constantly talks about this moment on Twitter that he had. He says, Gil, I understand the point of view, but I completely disagree with it. And in fact, it disrespects the character of Luke by treating him not as a true mythic hero overcoming reoccurring wounds and flaws, but as a video game character who's achieved a binary permanent power up, which is what a lot of people wanted out of Luke. So this person on Twitter, long story short, rewrote all of Luke on Twitter, character limit, like no one's gonna read that, and they went off, because I guess you can't be mad at something like, I don't know, gun control, global warming, if queefs are a bannable uh, offense as opposed to farting in a microphone. I don't know anything else. You know, he just had to do this. It's really stupid. I wanna talk about Crate. <laughs> also, this is like the wolf text which I really, really wanted. I want one of these. He tells Yoda that the sacred texts are burned. Luke tells Yoda, I can't be who she, meaning Rey, needs me to be. And so Luke does what he says he couldn't do. And why would Luke do this? Because that's what that's what the hero that these people think that he is. Because of you, now we have a chance. That droid has a map that leads straight to Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker. Luke. I have a theory where I think J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson knew this was gonna happen. And so what they did is they totally foreplayed the audience. Like they made fun of the, the viewers via Leia and Poe and Finn and Rey being like, Luke! <gasps> because when he came up on screen, that's how everybody reacted. I swear to God, I feel like they made fun of everybody because of the reaction. Like that's how, that's how like hung up everybody was. Luke says this quote where he goes, you think what? I'm gonna walk out with a laser sword and face down the whole first order. And he, <laughs> yep. So Luke using his old saber, the one that he's refusing to touch because he no longer accepts that role again. This is also the sword that, sword, you get what I mean, saber that rejected Kylo in The Force Awakens, which is also what taunts Kylo to being so insulted at the sight of Luke in addition to a bunch of other baggage. But uh, that's getting off topic. Also, another cool notice that I found is that Luke presented himself to Kylo exactly the way Luke was in the flashbacks when contemplating taking down Ben Solo. Now, when I went and I rewatched the films, I didn't take any photos. If you notice like throughout the rest of the history of Star Wars, when Luke fights, he's not really that animated in the face. But in this one, he was like hella smoldering, which is what he like never does. But he was hella smoldering in Kylo's recollection and he's hella smoldering in projection to Kylo Ren, which is just like something that like Jedi just don't fucking do. I have so many theories. This is like a way they're making fun of fans because they're like, this is what they wanted. Hell yeah. And they're like, this is what you wanted. <laughs> and like, so they just didn't give you it. And I love that. All that Kylo wanted to do is strike down Vader as badly as, all right, I have a mistype on this one actually. So Kylo wanted to strike down Luke just as badly as Vader had struck down Obi-Wan, but also Kylo once again wanted to forget the past and destroy it. And Luke is also a father figure to Kylo as Solo is a father, literal father to Kylo. So this is just him experiencing another fail. Luke knows anger is Kylo's weakness and exploits it to buy time and also teach Kylo one final lesson and as a way of biding time for the Rissons to escape. The second film in a row where Kylo shows that his path that he has laid out for has fucking ruined him. It's brought him failure. Luke saves the resistance on a literal level and ties all the themes together in this scene. Destroying the history of the Jedi will never serve well for future generations. Their failures will help forge Rey on a new path. And Luke's myth is the most hopeful thing that he can give, which yes, it is a lie, but it is still, it doesn't matter if he's really a hero or not. A lot of people don't like that. But using the force is also super fucking draining. And it is shown in a scene where Kylo is foreshadowing whilst talking to Rey via like mind force power, whatever the hell that was but he even says 
you're not doing this this effect this effort would kill you because the force can be draining luke knows he won't survive this but his story actually will so luke knows that sacrificing himself for something and that's the morality of it but anyway none of you guys give a fuck about these characters right because they're there too but that's okay i'll update you on what they're doing so poe eventually realized that it's less cool to blow things up and save lives more in this film and completes his arc when screaming that the cannon scene on crate is a pointless gesture and then also in an on the nose delivery it showcased when rose saves spin with a not so subtle but deserving quote of not fighting what we hate but saving what we love some of you guys need it goddamn spelled out for you uh which it just ties in the themes but anyway um on the other hand destructive power is not a sith thing but if you wanted luke to show up to crate to beat all of those AT-ATs and empire crew like vader would have in rogue one then that's not a jedi move the whole time in this film they're emphasizing that the same formula the jedi have always been facing was too rigid to follow and a change needs to come so to quote yoda he said as a Jedi uses the force for knowledge and defense. So that right there just dilutes the point of the Jedi. If you're mad that Luke didn't go down there, saber swinging like this, then I don't know what kind of Star Wars film you're fucking wanting, okay? You want a jerk off session. So anyway, in one interview, Johnson claims that, quote, if you wanted to take Luke Skywalker seriously, at least he has more depth than just an action figure. Yes, I am, Panda. Please get banned. <laughs> Hi, guys. It's editing Danica here. And I just wanted to let you know that Red Panda came in and wrote some salty shit in my stream. So as you saw, he got banned. But then he proceeded to join my Discord and write this salty comment. Yo, he just real big mad. He real big mad. Anyway, uh, more depth than an action figure on the wall, Johnson said. I have to get into why it felt right for me to get into the story and into the conversation. Luke's greatest achievement is actually not blowing up the Death Star, but resisting the dark side and refusing to fight. This on Crate in a larger scale, which was utilizing everything he knew about the Force and resolving the situation peacefully whilst initiating, I don't know, maybe a fucking spark? I don't know if it's spelled out for you in the very beginning of the fucking movie right there of hope to aid the fight for the next film. Star Wars was heavily inspired by classic westerns with its ensemble of outlaws and the lawlessness of open space. And in that tradition, Johnson takes an idea that we see in classic westerns like The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance and Fort Apache. In both films, an undeserving character is enshrined in legend for the greater good of the West. In The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, the false narrative that the idealistic Ransom Stoddard killed the seemingly unkillable Liberty Valance brings order to the West. And in Fort Apache, the lie that Captain Thursday died a noble hero enables the US military to continue continue its duty. He must have been a great man. And a great soldier. No man died more gallantly. Luke Skywalker may not have been the hero people thought he was, but the lie created around his epic last stand will go on to spark the next- SPARK! Movie. In a quote that equally describes all three movies, a reporter in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance proclaims, When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. The Last Jedi even uses the Western trope of a retired gunslinger, hesitant to enter back into the world of violence. Spark! Luke's death and what does it symbolize? Hope! Long after battle, little kids actually reenact what happened on Crate and a generation has hope. Then we see Broom Boy! Showcase that he also has force abilities? What the fuck is that? And then this alludes to the fact that there's a new generation that can be brought on on a different footing than the cycle that was once before. But where did he get that hope from? Luke and Rosenfinn. The Last Jedi did a good job attempting to escape a narrative of dynasties and noble blood. There were princesses, senators, higher ups doing most of the heavy lifting in the previous films as opposed to the newer characters coming from nothing. Little to no backstory and still being important. Rey, a villain backstory classically, she has every excuse to be a villain. She's raised by a monster, lonely, living on a planet that has a higher social standing than above her own. She is sold for drinking money. Angry heroes are actually very rare. Ryan Johnson touched on her internal demons and struggle and raised parents 
you can't do Rise of Skywalker on me, you guys. You can't do it. This is why this this slide right here is why I hate Rise of Skywalker. Grace's parents aren't special. Dynasties don't matter. Her knowing her parents doesn't add value, and you don't need a familiar name to make her fucking cool. Rose, again, I hate, I hate, I hate Rise of Skywalker so fucking much. Before traveling with Finn, Rose was but a meek technician in the bottom of a ship, doing nothing much on Canto Bight. Rose inspired the broom boy to have a lot more hope by showing him the Rebel Alliance ring and giving it to him. And after traveling with Finn, Rose is inspired to become a hero herself. And this is a value that a hero myth can have until you just write off her fucking character because y'all racist. Also, Broom Boy came from nothing, and Finn came from nothing, too. I mean, I think you guys fucking get it. So, the people who liked Rogue One and not Last Jedi bother me. Because they tend to be in a category of disliking change, yet they claim otherwise. This movie was filmed like the originals. It felt like the original. These people wanted Star Wars the way it was, and nothing new. So the people who liked Rogue One and not The Last Jedi fall into a category of, quote, keep doing the stuff we've seen before, but don't stop doing the stuff we've seen before, and no one gets hurt, you know? And I do care a lot about these stories, but I mean, like, I'm clearly sitting with you here right now presenting this all, and I, I'm gonna have to be doing a presentation about Rogue One as well, which I am just so fucking tired. I see I put a lot of work into this. It's like, I would rather just do another sub goal for this, I swear. I think there's an appeal that I'm missing of Rogue One. Like, I'm seeing it from all sides. I do think a movie like this that was rushed in a two-year span, they would have to result in, like, weird pacing being quite uneven, but I think that they managed to do the greatest shit that they could possibly do with the tools they had in just two years. The Force and how it works. The Force began as a vague metaphor for religion and just kept changing from when the cameras began rolling and none of the powers shown in the New Hope started to make much sense at all. Like the Force started to make dragon noises. You could disappear upon death. You can like move an object or you could like hands-free token, super reflexes. Like, I don't know, it's kind of fucking weird. It's kind of silly. In Empire, Luke seems to be able to have telekinesis and see through time and have super agility, but by the end of Return of uh, the Jedi, Palpatine is seen shooting lightning out of his fucking hands. What? It's basically just made up as they went on, which made for a flexible plot device, but there was just, this was just there to move the story along and the characters. So here's where once again, too much detail kills a story. You can get a hundred page Wikipedia article on Jedi leaping and running on Jedi legaments. Like, I'm not here to gatekeep and be a shit lord and shame nerds. The, the, the planet is dying. The planet is dying. Can you not write about joints for Jedis? Like, can you please do something else with your time that's beneficial to everybody? Because I won't, I don't want to hear about Jedi arthritis. Like, I don't. All this did was allow fans to just assume they know better than anyone else about Star Wars, even more than the filmmaker. So who's allowed to tell them that they're wrong? I truly believe that the only person's opinion that actually matters is the creator of the series. And George Lucas didn't give a shit about anything else except for the films and the Clone Wars. And in an interview with Total Film back in 2008, Lucas said, once Vader dies, he doesn't come back to life. The Emperor doesn't get cloned and Luke doesn't get married. Sorry. And as you know, Disney had to establish a, an entire committee to figure out what's canon and keep track and unify everything. So this includes The Last Jedi. And if you didn't take that as your system and you need a committee to rubber stamp your plot points for you for your consumption, then you're the one that actually doesn't get it and you're no better than they are. So fans hated the midichlorian theory because it made the force seem small. But if you condense the force into a book to be sold over by Kenner, that's virtually the same fucking thing. And also everybody laughed at this scene and I think it was a salute to the very sweaty fan. It's not out of force works. Han Solo doesn't believe in the force as well. This is just a sidebar. And then when this one came out, it's kind of like he absolutely believes in the force now. And then he believes in it enough to know about it. And he actually really doesn't like the toxic fans for Star Wars. He just doesn't, he does not, he doesn't do that. So I thought it was just great. He's just making fun of them. I also have a theory and so does Neryl on YouTube. I use a lot of his videos because his videos were perfect. Um, Neryl and I share the same view of how we think Empire would look if it came out in 2017. Visual aberrations were never established in the prior oh, canon. You now can't he's just make abilities up. Oh, he's now Skype he's choking him. Through the TV. Him. Okay. Oh, hello. Uh, yeah. Pressurized okay. space just suit. Walk out it's negative 100 degrees on an asteroid. Stupid. Is there a cozy atmosphere so in this space stupid. rock fan fiction? You can only survive in space for 10 section. seconds. I Googled but it. What is wow. a creature like this even what? eating? How does this Are many spaceships flying out to the remote asteroid field? I am the 
father. Oh they ruined God. my childhood. What a mess of they ruined it. They ruined Luke's wow. character and Vader's character. Where's the Vader's time? backstory. Fuck you, Irvin wow. Kershner. That's what it would have looked like if it came out in 2017. Nero's great. I use a lot of his videos. I credit him in my sources. He can make fun of the goofy flaws in the film, like the Mary Poppins flying scene or the terrible throne room choreography. But like, I bet you didn't realize that you disliked that fight scene until you watched a fight choreographer break it down for you. And believe me, I didn't enjoy the cringe flips just as much in the very beginning of the fight either. However, these two scenes didn't take me out of enjoying this film. Neither did the scene of Rose smashing into Finn with enough force to kill him over on Crate, but this didn't make me feel forced to judge it. Star Wars has a lot of issues like this. It's not new. So if you're team trashing the films based off of those points, I just want to point out the following. There were many times where Vader's lines were cut when James Earl Jones had to redo the voice acting of Vader. And due to this, there's many scenes where the original actor is speaking, but they mute him and he's no longer talking. Firing a laser in this specific moment would have won the whole war. And if you're nitpicking at the other two factors, then I'd implore you to nitpick the series as an entire whole. Otherwise, you're just being fucking petty. I didn't have pictures of it because I ran out of time and I just didn't. At this point, you can see I did my homework. So I just got tired of pictures and stuff and finding pictures of specific moments. The Ewok battle between the stormtroopers in the third film has little tiny teddy bears throwing little tiny rocks at big old stormtroopers and they completely knock them out of their center of gravity. The troopers act as if they're on a soccer field getting kicked in the shin trying to egg a referee on to call a flag. It's stupid. The throne fight in the Mary Poppins scene shouldn't have taken you out of the film alone. That is not something I'm gonna buy as logical here. That is fucking stupid. This is an old power recontextualized. Now, stop what I'm reading right now and I'm just gonna tell you, I tried so hard to clip these into GIFs and the GIF maker was being a shit lord and it wouldn't work work half the time because I guess I was doing it so much. I ended up giving up. So some of these gifts don't line up, but you get my point. Pulling yourself through gravity is not an old ability. It is a new one recontextualized. Look here, that's a photo here. All right. There, Yoda pulls it from his belt, right? There, he just, Obi just pulls it through the, yep. This one's fucked up. But, Ma but Mace Windu pulls, I don't know why, it made it look like this guy's getting railed by a Rancor thing or whatever. That, I forget what creature that's called. One of you guys knows it because y'all are nerds. But anyway, Mace Windu pulls his saber, which by the way, he doesn't have any backstory explained. So like, I don't know why you guys care about him. Anyway, uh, but yeah, he pulls his saber and then this. Why you guys complain about our ability to use the force? The OG trilogy says that the force comes to those in dire need of help, which happens pretty often. I think we can all agree at this moment that Leia is launched into space. So that's pretty dire need of fucking help, okay? This is this is a really dire spot in her life, and I'd argue that this ability is no different than pulling a saber towards yourself. Also, Luke mentions in Return of the Jedi that Leia could one day use the force, and I thought that is kind of cool. We get to see that on film, which is really nice, considering that Carrie Fisher got to do so right before she passed away. Also, Paired with her theme song in full splendor, backed by John Williams. I don't know. I guess I didn't hate it as much as you guys fucking did. And this is the same thing. It's a power commonly seen throughout the films and in general. Seriously, pulling yourself to something? I don't see why this is being made fun of. Especially since these scenes didn't drag on as long as it did, because you guys are acting like it was 10 minutes long. Yes, you can survive being exposed to vacuum chamber conditions for a few minutes. According to the scientificamerican.com, because your girl did her fucking homework, there's papers from NASA in 1965 and 1967 where researchers found that chimpanzees can survive up to 3.5 minutes in near vacuum conditions with no apparent cognitive defects. In reality, however, animal experiments and actual human accidents have shown that people can likely survive in vacuum exposed conditions for at least a couple of minutes. Not that you'd remain conscious long enough to rescue yourself, but if your predicament was accidental, there could be time for fellow crewmates to rescue and repressurize you with few ill effects. So now I'm gonna talk to you about some absolutely silly, oh my God. I like to call these scenes popcorn corn bucket filling scenes or cringe moments. Um, so my theory of what these mean is if you get up, if you're watching any of these in a theater and you get up out of your seat, scoot down the aisles because everybody's feet's in the way and it's just a fucking mess and you got to move all these people and the people have their popcorn buckets on the floor. You got to shuffle out of there. You got to walk down the steps of the theater, stumbling around. You got to hook a left or a right to get out of the theater, walk all the way down, hook another left or a right to get out of the theater and go all the way down another aisle area 
area to go down another aisle area to get to the popcorn area to refill your popcorn bucket or to go to the bathroom. And by the time you repeat that whole process and you come back to sit down and your homie's there at the movie theater and you go, hey man, what I miss? And they go, literally nothing. <laughs> That's what these scenes are. We got your favorite scene in the entire Star Wars universe, the pod racing scene. And then we got, this is actually like, I don't mind this one that much. I actually really mind this one. Nine minutes of screen time. Nine minutes of screen time, you guys. Nine minutes long. Nine minutes long. How about Ewok Coachella where C-3PO becomes a god, right? Three minutes and 38 seconds of screen time, you guys. That was so long. We got more, boys and girls and whatever gender you identify as. I don't give a fuck. You're all welcome in here. This motherfucker. <laughs> And then we got 40 fucking 11 million goddamn Jedis we don't give a shit about looking like they play in an Xbox Connect game. Three minutes and 18 seconds of screen time combined. His whole scenes, all of his scenes, every time he showed up. Every time. Then we got this weird gladiator dome fight where they really, Star Wars really thought they did something, but it didn't really do damn thing. It was awful. Three minutes. Seven seconds of screen time. The Canto bite scene, I do not believe, deserves to be thrown away. The Canto bite scene that you have gripes with? Two minutes of screen time! Two, and let me be fair, this is the extended version, okay? I don't give a shit. Granted, the Canto bite scenes are never going to be as impressive as Luke and Ray's story, but that doesn't mean it needs to be tossed out. And also, if you didn't have enough Canto bite, you could get a goddamn book filling it all out for you. Don't worry. I looked it up. If you didn't get enough of that, because Star Wars fans have to have it all spelled out. The Canto bite scene is used as a way to show the world that, exi that exists beyond the resistance and the First Order fighting each other. We see people who don't care. We see people who profit. We see poor people, slave children, who are hopeless. And in The Last Jedi, this actually establishes that a war economy exists in the Star Wars universe, which weapons merchants sell military equipment to both sides of the resistance, not now Merlin, and the First Order. There's always hope in the galaxy and clearly a disturbance in the Force due to Luke's death, gave a hope to the slave children and Canto Bite in the very last scene of Last Jedi, the little Force-sensitive kid at the end is the symbol of all. The importance of Canto Bite isn't fully clear until the very last scene of The Last Jedi. I'm writing, what are you writing scene? I'm not gonna change the scene for Merlin right now. The Last Jedi in which we return to the stable and to the children who live there, it is possible that Canto Bite is echoing Bespin from Empire Strikes Back, which is also a business planet profiting during war. And once again, you witness Star Wars fans misinterpret every single thing literally as possible, where people thought it was setting up a Broom Boy trilogy. The Solus corporate version would have been to do easy fan service, and The Last Jedi maintained the polar opposite of the trajectory. You guys can look at Merlin for a second. I got him this new toy that spins, but it suctions to a window, and he keeps taking it off the window because he doesn't like it there. But it doesn't suction to the desk. But are you gonna play with this? Can you do something besides just stare at it? Damn, it really do be spinning though. Aren't you glad we did that? All right, anyway. So here I come with another one of the most criticized plot points I've ever seen so far. So here I come with another one of the most criticized plot points I've done so far. And this one actually got me and Domestic Dan kind of like, Dan was wrong. Dan was wrong. And I'm not trying to be sassy. Dan was legitimately wrong. So here, I, can the Merlin break come on YouTube? Yeah, I could do that. Although. Here I go. <laughs> this is where you guys need to take your fantasy logic and just stop because it doesn't apply here. Holdo was handpicked by loyal command staff and was deemed trusted by Leia. We needed to have an unknown character to put doubt and mistrust into you because that's what the movie wanted you to do. There's a lot of drama and uproar with fans just shouting at a, at a screen and me that I should have confided in Poe what her plans were. Once again, Poe's demoted and he's the reason why the fleet is in this position from the get go. And as I said before, Poe should have been executed for what he did, he's lucky to be fucking alive. Let alone be given privileged information, such as whatever the fuck Holdo was keeping between herself and her trusted command staff. Holdo's lips were sealed because she knew that all it would take was for one double crosser or brave fucking idiot to run off and do something crazy, which is a trope in Star Wars, doing something crazy enough 
to work to blow their plans. And guess what? It fucking happened. So why are you blaming her? Poe was reckless as he was gifted and he needed tough love to remove his rank in order to actually preserve resources, which he still had fucked around. Poldo couldn't simply trust an unpredictable pilot, pilot and that's valid and that's called following orders. Also, um, do you guys want to know like a really cool theory that I really didn't like about Last Jedi that I really, 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 really fucking wish would have happened and it would have broke everybody's hearts, but I would have loved, I would have lived for it. I wish because knowing that Carrie Fisher passed away, I wish that Leia like got out of her coma like she does and she walked over to Holdo and she went, I got this. And then she got on that ship and sacrificed herself and Holdo, and Holdo can just take over from that point on. And then Kylo would just sit there and just go, oh my God, my mom, I like killed my mom instead. Oh my God. I hated her death in The Rise of Skywalker. Her Rise of Skywalker death was essentially like, I'm pretty tired. I'm going to take a nap. And the second she said she was tired and she was going to take a nap, I was like, don't you fucking die taking a nap. And then they like put a blanket over her and then they just worked with her body there. Like that's not the death Leia needed. Oh my God. She's like, oh, throw a little blanket on it. Oh, put a, put a blanket on move it around get it they put something over it so like they get like one of those breakfast tables they just put over her corpse so that they could just put their paperwork on top of her fucking body like jesus christ so emery we're gonna keep rise of skywalker out but i'm just saying that's my side note I took a test i took a test with some of you guys where i asked what are your most like biggest concerns with the rise of Sky not the rise of skywalker with the last jedi what would you have wanted y'all were saying some stupid shit you said you wanted admiral akbar to be holdo i'm sorry several comments bitching that holdo wasn't replaced by Akbar. there's no fucking way any single one of you guys would take this seriously for more than a minute. He's a punchline queen, he says a couple of lines, and I don't give a fuck. That's it. So let's talk about how the fans are wrong. I understand some of the backsplash that this is a challenging film, however, it doesn't deserve to have the hate it clearly gets when there's worse movies out there, like Solo. So I think that the hatred deserves, deserves and deserved to be taken down a notch. This definitely is a love letter to the series and not a trash heat bomb that people are making it out to be. The fans didn't realize how hateful and gross they can be with all this anger and it trickles down together. The movie was very ambitious for only two years to prepare for it, so of course it would turn out uneven and though some parts did feel rushed, I found that the faults that the people were quite hung up on were petty and the hate deserves to be taken down a bunch of notches. And this movie has actually originated from a place of love from the series. Ryan Johnson had zero intention of destroying the franchise that we hate, but rather preserving the characters that we love and allowing them to move forward. Anyway, one of the biggest complaints is that the newer films weren't like the originals, and I have to ask the viewers if they even understand what that even means, because the older films were actually super fucking silly and not to be taken seriously. They had a low budget, used a lot of garage sale items as props. How do I, well, Danica, how do you, how do you know? know this, Danica. How do you know this? I don't know. Maybe I'm like a professional cosplayer who's toured along the 501st Legion for the last six or seven years, and I've seen the movie props firsthand, and I'm also part of the Rebel Legion, and I've made props, and I've had my shit tested for movie accuracy and authenticity. I don't know. Maybe, maybe fuck me, right? Like, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, there's a large dog flying a ship with no pants on, but like, go off, right? Whatever. In a way, the film was pretty on par with Empire, yet not at the very same time. A hopeful future Jedi travels out to a planet to be trained and ignores their master's advice and discovers information about their parents, switching Billy D. Williams for Del Toro and even tossing a betrayal scene in there. However, in Last Jedi, the Mentor refuses to help. Ray's parents aren't legendary and have zero backstory. The black hole in the center of the island is also similar to the vision Luke had in Empire. Ray finds nothing there in a deliberate misdirection compared to Luke and Empire. Yes, they're similar, but they're also different and not what you wanted. But to the amount of hate bombing this movie has received, fans have crafted a world of their own where The Last Jedi was not a commercial success and that Ryan Johnson hates the film. And this gathering hate mob gathered together to falsify the idea that one, The Last Jedi was a failure financially. Two, Ryan Johnson went off and ruined his career. I'm sorry, he made Knives Out and got many hella awards for that. And a second one is on its way. Mark Hamill hates the films and Ryan Johnson as much as the fans do, which was forced into a permanent echo chamber by the fandom itself. And this echo chamber, fans seem to claim, Mark Hamill hates the films as much as they do. They cherry pick Mark Hamill's reaction to Luke, yet they seem to forget this part uh, where Luke says, I have tried, I had trouble accepting what he, Ryan Johnson, saw for Luke. And then, but again, I mean, I have to say, having seen the movie, I was wrong. I think being pushed out of your comfort zone is a good thing because if I was just another benevolent Jedi training young Padawans, we've seen it. 
Also, I can't get this video to work. I can't get it to work. But anyway, I have more. It doesn't matter. But this video is a huge interview, I think, at San Diego Comic-Con. And Mark Hamill goes on and on and on and on and on about how he made a mistake disagreeing with Ryan Johnson. But it's okay, because I have this too. So Mark Hamill hates Ryan Johnson and The Last Jedi as much as the fans do. Having seen the movie, I was wrong. He's always right. He's always right. But he was always right. I'm firmly in Ryan's camp now. All right. Well, then also, I remember, because I've even seen it myself, that Mark Hamill tweeted out saying that he didn't like the, the, the Last Jedi because he initially saw one bad review and freaked out. And then he, he wrote this before he had even seen the films himself because he took somebody else's advice and just did that. But then he wrote, I regret voicing my doubts and insecurities in public. Creative differences are a common element of any project, but usually remain private. And all I had wanted was to make a good movie. I got more than that. Ryan Johnson made an all-time great one. Hamill called out The Last Jedi, and he called it an all-time great film. I don't think that this pans out for you guys who are trying to lean against the fact that Mark Hamill hated the films. But people cling to his initial takes and not his many discussions where he spent 2017 through 2018 in every single public interview he's ever given talking about how what he said was an actual mistake. Stake, and he changed his mind having seen the movie in its entirety. So here's another reason why the fans are wrong. The film didn't disrupt, up, disrupt anything that he had planned. And there's quotes where he says, the story that we're telling, the story that started to conceive when we did The Force Awakens uh, was allowed to continue. This is J.J. Abrams saying that episode seven didn't derail anything that we were t thinking about. So also there was an arc set for the trilogy. Johnson didn't wreck anything set forth. It says there was a general plan for the three films. I focused on The Force Awakens. Ryan Johnson saw what we were making and we had a meeting. He followed his inspiration and he didn't undo anything we were thinking about. About, I'm insisting on it. Then JJ actually loved the script so much that he had wished that he had written it himself in this one interview over here. He said that it was something that is so good he wished he was making it. In addition to this, the film inspired JJ Abrams to do bolder moves with Star Wars. I don't know what else to fucking tell you guys, but I guess I have more things to tell you guys, so I'm not done. This is why the fans are the worst. Due to many of the fans' inability to adapt to adversity, edits to Mary Trang's Wikipedia page simply just because they didn't like her and was a result of her having to terminate herself from all social media accounts and then in Rise of Skywalker having half of her screen time removed. And I don't know the numbers exactly, but I think she had like... I want to say like 14 or so minutes of screen time in, in The Last Jedi. And then it trickled down to like like one whole Canto bite amount of screen time, like two minutes long. It really fucking sucked. It really sucked. Like that's really upsetting. Like, that, it, like I don't even like Star Wars that much anymore. Y'all crazy. Like look at that. Also, cha they changed her Wikipedia page to a bunch of racist shit. As a result, she took herself off of social media. Fans also review bombed The Last Jedi because they simply just wanted to throw a goddamn tantrum. The tomato meter for critics gave it a 90. I agree with that. 476 reviews. 100,000 plus ratings for The Last Jedi to give it a 42%. We're not done. Daisy Ridley left social media altogether as a result for portraying Rey in the Star Wars, in Star Wars from all of the hate and backlash. And also Ahmed Best, I don't know, maybe the actor for Jar Jar Binks, every time you guys make fun of him. He discussed in solidarity of Rose's actress of contemplating taking his own life over the backlash of Jar Jar Binks. So how do you feel about that? You know, that's not cool. And then he talks about in his Twitter, oh, he ended up having a son later and he never thought that he could, you know? That's kind of cool. The shit on Star Wars more, right? Also, when you bite the hand that feeds, George Lucas proposed a question here and he makes a valid point. He says, why would I make any more Star Wars movies when everybody yells at you all the time and tells you what a terrible person you are? If you're one of the people that hates this movie, nothing I said has changed your mind and that's fine. In comparison to the pettiness that I've seen from some fans favoring Rogue One in comparison to Last Jedi, this doesn't add up in the least bit. We should appreciate the journey that these directors want to take us on and not the ones that we want to go on. Otherwise, we get a product that looks like Rise of Skywalker. And if you don't like it, criticize it, but do it fairly with in mind that every inch of this film did come from human beings who grew up loving the stories just as much as we do. They worked themselves half to death. We should relax the stranglehold. Let a director have Star Wars for a few hours and welcome the birth of a new story. Forget your demands and your rule books. Allow them to take you on a journey they want to take you on. These films deserve fair criticisms and not jerk off sessions. There's a lot of you guys in the chat, by the way. I'm talking to you guys. Y'all want jerk off sessions where you get kudos for finding inconsistencies based off your made up rule book on Star Wars. And I guarantee half of them aren't even fucking canon. So shut up. Also, I was going to talk about this and then I didn't care anymore. So, 
I didn't write anything. But it was on par of, Captain Phasma gets killed off way too quickly. But then y'all don't complain about Boba Fett. And I'm just saying, Phasma had way more screen time and way more dialogue than Boba Fett did. But none of y'all complain about Boba Fett getting killed off so fast. But I don't have anything written down about them. But I just, here's my sources. We're done. No further questions. <laughs> no, no further questions. <laughs> to all of you guys that like The Last Jedi and you had to hide in a cave because you can't admit it, this is a, this is a, this is a Last Jedi open zone. You can come out. I know that there's so many people who really like The Last Jedi and they're too afraid to admit it.